Hello and welcome to Baltimore's Inner Harbor on Chesapeake Bay. My name is Brian Auer and I've been a guide here at the Historic Ships in Baltimore for over a decade. But I have to concede that the largest, most resilient, and most experienced guide at the museum is right behind me. Lightship 116 was also known as Lightship Chesapeake because she spent 29 years guiding mariners to safe harbor in the Chesapeake Bay. She was decommissioned in January 1971 and acquired by the National Park Service, who operated it for public education. Since 1982, the ship has been on loan to the city of Baltimore, where it serves as a museum today. The keel was laid down in February 1929 at the Charleston Machine and Dry Dock Company in Charleston, South Carolina. Her construction was complete by October 1929 at a cost of nearly $275,000, or about $4.3 million today. Now many of our visitors have never heard the term lightship and often don't know what these vessels were for. So let's head aboard and take a closer look at what lightships do and how their crews operate them. Lightships are basically floating lighthouses. And just like lighthouses, they primarily serve as navigational aids to mark significant or hazardous locations, to mark channels and sea lanes, and to provide a visual reference for mariners. Lightships were used for locations where lighthouses or buoys were not practical. In the case of Lightship Chesapeake, that was 17 miles off the Atlantic coast of Cape Henry, Virginia, to mark the entrance of the Chesapeake Bay. Lightship 116 was part of the 100 class of lightships designed and built for the U.S. Lighthouse Service. It was the last class of lightships built for the service before it was combined, along with the Revenue Marine and the U.S. Life Saving Service, into the modern Coast Guard in 1939. Basically, our job was to stay put in one location, on station, and provide a visual signal to nearby ships to mark that location. The light ship provided that signal with several methods. The first is our main light, which is atop the mainmast. It has a 1500 watt bulb that produced 35,000 candle power and could be viewed on a clear day as far as 14 miles away. The second type of signal was a high frequency direction finding radio beacon. The wiring you can see between the mast is the antenna for the radio. The third was the audible signals needed for low visibility conditions. For that, the ship was equipped with a horrendously loud foghorn. Seriously, every lightship veteran that I've heard give their recollections had something to complain about that foghorn. We also had the fog bell here. Both of these provided an audible signal for the ships to home in on, and the foghorn would sound twice per minute until visibility cleared. Now the ship had to stay on station in all types of weather to ensure that those signals stayed active to guide other ships to safety. And to help us remain on station, we had some special equipment. If you follow me back here, you can see one of our two 5,000 pound mushroom anchors. Now these are heavier than your average anchor for a ship this size. And the shape of that mushroom anchor allows it to fill with silt and sediment and actually dig itself into the bottom. These anchors do a pretty good job keeping the ship on station but we know of at least two occasions where rough seas caused the anchor chain to fail, requiring the ship to use its motor to try and maintain a fixed position. We're now in the pilot house on the ship, and that's the location of the main helm, which is the big wheel right in front of me. But we also have the radar console, which was added later in the ship service. Behind the helm, we have our compass binnacle, which is our magnetic compass for maintaining our course heading. Behind me is our motor order telegraph for sending speed orders down to the engine room to change our speed. And then interestingly, just above the helm here is a speaking tube, which allows you to speak into this end and to hear a response from the other end. It makes for very easy communication and tends not to have technical difficulties. Like on most ships, the commanding officer is quartered near the command bridge. His stateroom is just after the pilot house on the main deck. Below on the second deck was the living space for the crew. Here at the forward end of the ship was crew's berthing, which had five staterooms with two bunks each for the crew. The ship was designed for a crew of 16, including officers, but was rarely full due to personnel rotations ashore. As technology progressed, some comforts improved, such as the addition of TV, which could be picked up when you're only 17 miles offshore. Speaking of comforts, the crew also had access to a refrigerator here on the second deck, a rare luxury in the 1930s lighthouse service. Just forward of crew berthing on the second deck 
we have the anchor windlass room. Now this anchor windlass is a big machine and it looks very big considering the size of the ship that we're on. But remember, Lightship 116 used mushroom anchors, which would be filled with sediment on the bottom and buried into the silt at the bottom as well. And it would take a lot of force to pull that anchor up when the ship needs to get moving. The crew had their own mess deck amidships with easy access to the galley where the ship's cook prepared all shipboard meals. The cook even got his own stateroom amidship on the starboard side. The officers each had a private stateroom adjoining the wardroom at the stern of the ship. Just like other ships, officers sleep, eat, and relax separate from the enlisted crew to maintain that aura of authority and privilege. There is a relatively luxurious settee here in the wardroom for the officers, although you'll note the rudder quadrant is right over their heads. Just as a side note, while some of the ship's features may have been relatively luxurious compared to the ships of other services, lightship duty could still be strenuous. Additionally, duty on station could be uncomfortable at times and dangerous at worst. In bad weather or low visibility, the FT2 diaphone foghorn sounded twice per minute, even during the night. Ah, imagine hearing that over your head every two minutes while trying to sleep. Also, it was common for ships to steer a course directly toward the lightship in order to reach the harborage they marked. This collision course often resulted in just that. In one notable incident in 1934, Lightship 117, we're on Lightship 116, so Lightship 117 was rammed and sunk by Titanic's sister ship, Olympic. Olympic was 75 times larger than the lightship and her sheer weight completely smashed and sunk the lightship. Lightship 117 sunk so fast that many of the crew didn't even have time to get out. Seven of her 11 crew perished, and the White Star Line paid for a replacement lightship. The engine room is in the bottom of the lightship, and it's where the engines generated the electricity used by the ship for propulsion and for powering all the equipment on board. When built, Lightship 116 was relatively advanced for her day. She was equipped with four GM671 diesel generator sets that together create 300 kilowatts of DC electricity to power the propulsion motor. When propulsion is not needed, electricity for the onboard signaling equipment and other routine electrical needs was generated by the ship service GM271 diesel generator sets, which have smaller generators to make enough electricity to keep the ship running while sitting on station. The big tanks up here are storage for the compressed air for the ship's diaphone foghorn, which replaced an earlier electric foghorn. Also, note the riveting on the tank and in the back here on the hull, which is vintage to the days before welding became the standard for joining structural steel. We're now inside the main cubicle at the aft end of the main engine room. The cubicle walls are not original to the ship, but because the engines were so loud, the National Park Service installed these partitions in the 1970s when they were operating the ship as an education vessel. Now this panel here has the switches to distribute the power to the various pieces of equipment and parts of the ship. And uh, I should note that you won't see a modern installation that looks like this. These knife switches here provide the contacts for the different electrical connections and each one of these terminals is dangerously exposed, which is why they have these wood barriers here to prevent crew from accidentally leaning back against the electrical panel, because if they did that um, and your body connected two of those terminals, it would probably be the last thing you did. The other end of the motor order telegraph is down here as well, because this is where we would receive and make speed changes from the pilot house. Now, the pilot house would order a speed change by turning their handle and the arrow here would move to whatever their order was. I would respond that I heard the order and that I understand by matching my arrow to theirs. And I would do that by moving my handle up to match their order. So they would see on their end that I heard. And you can see when I do that up here, it's a very simple bicycle chain system that turns the handle and the arrows at their end so they would see what we're doing down here. It's very simple technology. 
The motor room is just after the engine room, and the biggest feature in here is the General Electric 350 horsepower main propulsion motor, which got its electricity from our diesel generator sets forward in the engine room. Now the propeller shaft, the seat back aft, heads from the motor out to the propeller, which is outside the vessel through the outer hull. Now this motor was only used to get to and from station or during heavy weather when the anchor dragged or failed completely. I mentioned earlier that we know of two occasions, at least, where strong storms caused the anchor chain to fail. One was in the 1930s, and the crew was forced to rely on our main propulsion motor in order to try to maintain a fixed location. The other occasion was in 1962, during what has since become known as the Great Ash Wednesday Storm, which was a nor'easter that slammed the mid-Atlantic coast. According to the Mariner's weather log, Sustained high wind gales created 30 foot waves on coastal beaches and damaged structures that caused estimates of around $200 million in damage. That storm still ranks as one of the top 10 most damaging storms on the East Coast. Recorded in the same Mariner's weather log, Lightship Chesapeake was hit by a 50 foot wave which broke our anchor chain and caused enough damage to the ship that even our main propulsion motor uh, wasn't enough to keep us on station, so the ship had to return to port temporarily for repairs. She was relieved on station by a relief light ship until she could be repaired and returned to her station. After she was replaced in the Chesapeake, Lightship 116 served on the Delaware Bay Station until 1970, when a buoy took her place and she was finally decommissioned. I hope you enjoyed this look at Lightship Chesapeake, and be sure to stop aboard if you visit Baltimore's Inner Harbor.